Hi, I'm Wintley Phipps, and welcome to our program, Perfecting Me, Becoming More Like Jesus. I'm so glad you've joined us. My guests today on our program are Ruthie Jacobson, head of prayer ministry of the North American Division of Seventh-day Adventists, Pastor Errol Stoddard, senior pastor of the Church of the Oranges of Seventh-day Adventists in Orange, New Jersey, and Adley Campos, speaker and president of Family Wellbeing International. They'll be joining me on our discussion later in the program. This program is dedicated to the belief that there is nothing more important or more exciting you can do with your life than to become every day more like Jesus. Every program is a celebration of how God's power is at work in our lives. We trust you will find joy in being able to say every day, Jesus is molding me, shaping me, and every day he is perfecting me. Now let's get started. I have been blessed to get to know a dear brother in the Lord. His name is Dave Blakesley, and Dave is a potter, a potter who loves the Lord. Let's go into a shop and see Dave at work. God says in the process of creation, he says, let us make man in our image. And I think as an artist, there is this process where we visualize something that comes up out of us and we either speak it into existence or form it into existence. And that's the act of creativity. The creative expression that I have come to enjoy over the last 40 years is making pottery out of clay. Uh, I'm delighted in being part of a long string of humanity that has made pottery for thousands of years. I love the idea of pottery being used that I've made with my own hands. Uh, I love the firing of pottery. I love working with clay. Every aspect of it fascinates me. Clay is wonderfully soft and formable. It responds to whatever impression it receives. And I, I just love that fact that I can make anything I want out of it. It yields to my hands, to the things that I see uh, ahead for it. And I believe that we have the same opportunity with God, who is a creative God, who desires to form and fashion beauty and challenge and opportunities into our lives. And as we, like clay, yield to Him, yield to His hands in a sense, uh, He makes beautiful people, beautiful lives out of what we might originally say, how could this happen? How could this be? Before I turn this clay into a vessel, to a piece of pottery, I need to go through a process called wedging. And in that, I am going to cut the clay in half, slam it together a few times, then go ahead and knead it, much like you would with dough. Uh, this is a fairly forceful process in order to push out any air bubbles in the clay and to homogenize it. And it, it, this is my first encounter with this piece of clay. And the clay is probably feeling that uh, this potter's got a fair amount of strength in his hands. Uh, there's a certain amount of searching going on on my part to check out the quality of the clay. Is it going to be useful for what I want to make out of it? And I'm preparing it for that purpose. This clay by and of itself is never going to become a pot, a vessel, a pitcher, a platter, or whatever. Um, it's going to require a potter. It's going to require surrendering, in a sense, submitting to the potter's hands. Uh, and we have to, at some point in our life, agree with God, uh, commit ourselves to God, surrender to Him. What that means for me as a person is that there was a day in which, actually at this wheel, 
uh, I decided that it was time to follow him for the rest of the days of my life. And I submitted to him in that and connected, in a sense, to his kingdom and to his authority and climbed up on the wheel, if you will. At which point God began to work in my life. And I discovered so many things about God that I never knew before. I discovered an incredible loving Father. I discovered the wonder of His Word. I discovered the presence of His Spirit in our lives. That's a wonderful uh, idea that we could be fulfilled to the utmost uh, in our lives by yielding to God's invitation of let me make you into this. And we may not know from the beginning what this is, but we're just simply saying yes, yes, yes. And in the end we can look back and see all that he's formed. And what I'm doing right now, this is called centering. I think of the centering process is the process of becoming still in God. So the centering process for me represents that time that I'm going to spend with God. Now that may sound rather strange. Does God enter the room? Do I see him? No. Sometimes I feel a sense of his spirit. Sometimes I feel a new peace, a new joy. Sometimes I'm inspired by a new thought. Sometimes I'll read something in scripture or a, a book that's inspirational about God. I believe that God desires to communicate to us. This is not a very exciting process right now. When is the pot going to be formed? But this is foundational for a good pot. It needs to be centered. The clay has to be uniform and still in my hands. It's important for us to become still in the hands of an incredibly wise, powerful, and loving God. This clay is beginning to trust me, beginning to recognize that I have a lot of strength, but that I'm gentle in my approach to it. I don't want to destroy it, I want to form it. I want to form it into something that it never dreamt it could become. In the book of Genesis, chapter two, verse seven, the word of God says, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. For just a moment, I would like you to imagine yourself as an eyewitness to God creating the world. I found that thinking about God's unlimited capacity for creativity will stretch your imagination to its limits. Men build houses and skyscrapers out of brick and mortar. God built the sky and all the billions of planets out of nothing but his word and power. There is no limit to God's competence and creative thoughts. You know, when man creates anything, he needs a starter kit. The cook in the kitchen has to start with certain ingredients to make her creation. And think about it. Every billionaire genius who has ever lived on the earth needed a starter kit. Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, Alexander Graham Bell, the Wright brothers. They didn't build something out of nothing. They all started with something, but not so with God. God didn't need a starter kit. He's the only one who can create something out of nothing. When the angels looked at what God had made, they marveled at his artistry and vision. And then to top it all off, God made man. God made us. Man was the crowning act of the creation of God. Just think, mankind was made by a master artist. And to help us understand the process he used to create us, 
God in his word likened himself to a potter. Isaiah 64 verse 8 says, But now, O Lord, thou art our father. We are the clay, and thou our potter. And we all are the work of thy hand. Jeremiah 18 verse 6 says, Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. And then in Genesis 1:27, the word of God says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Friends, when God created man, he created us to resemble, reflect, and reveal his image, and not only his image, but his character. And if there's one thing in the world Satan hates most, it is the image and character of God. Wherever the character of God is manifested, Satan is determined to obliterate and destroy it. And he wants to wipe from the character of man any traces of the image and character of God. His war is not so much with us as it is with the character of God. The great controversy is all about the distortion and misrepresentation of the character of God. The servant of the Lord says, he who rejects the life and character of Jesus, refusing to be like him, declares himself to be in controversy with God. God made us in his image. Now joining us again are my guests, Ruthie Jacobson, Adley Campos, and Errol Stoddard. I want to begin by asking them about what they believe they know about the character of God. Sister Adley, tell me, what do you know and what do you believe about the character of God? First of all, I know that he is loved. Yeah. He has shown us in a very specific and wonderful, marvelous way, how much he loves us by sending his only son to this earth so that we could have salvation. A profound, deep love. That is what characterizes his character, a person as holy as it is God. Wonderful, and love is the zenith of his character. It is the pinnacle Amen. of all of the attributes of God's character. Love is the highest. Pastor Stoddard, what do you believe and what do you know about the character of God? Well, I, I always reference uh, the book of Exodus. When God came down to the mountain to speak with Moses, Moses went up on Mount Sinai to commune with God. God revealed himself as a God of mercy, a God of goodness, a God who is righteous. I think about God in terms of him being the good shepherd. When I think of his character, he's a nurturer. He's, uh, he's, he cares. He looks out for the sheep. And of course, uh, as was so eloquently said by Sister Campus, he's a God of love. All of these things uh, are really a demonstration of God being a loving and caring God. And it's interesting, when Moses said, show me your glory, God didn't show him lightning in the sky or fireworks. God began to tell him about his character. And there's a wonderful statement, the glory of God is his character. His character. And so wherever I look in the Bible and I see the character of God, I know it's talking about the glory of God. And wherever I see the glory of God, I know it's talking about the character of God. Uh, Ruthie, what do you want people to know about the character of God? Well, Whitley, my husband and I have a favorite hymn. It's number 100 in our hymnal. Great is thy faithfulness. Yes. Oh God, my Father, there is no shadow of turning with thee. Yeah. Thou changest not. Thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. And you know, his word doesn't return unto him void. He cannot lie. He's faithful. He's trustworthy. 
He is a God of love, a God of mercy, a God of power. And we can depend on him because his word is true and he is faithful. Yeah. And I love that last him, the last verse. And of course, the whole song is a prayer. Mm-hmm. Pardon for sin yes. and a peace that endureth. Yes. Thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with 10,000 besides. Yes, absolutely. You know, that's, to me, that's, that's the character of God. Yes. Is it necessary to become like the character of God to be saved? Uh, Pastor Stoddard, what do you think? Is it, is it necessary? Well, I, you know, I was reading a book um, this week, earlier this week, and, uh, and a pastor I had a conversation with a member of his church. A member of his church basically said, you know, Pastor, I really don't want to be a disciple. I just want to be a regular member of the church. <laughs> uh, you know, I, this thing of discipleship and all of that, I don't want wow. to get into all that. Uh, I'm already saved as a Christian. I don't need the rest of that. And uh, I think that a lot of people uh, who are Christians often have the mindset that all I need to do is to believe a set of doctrines, to have a certain theology, to uh, ha- to ascribe to a certain, um, you know, code of ethics. Mm-hmm. And I don't need the rest of it. Character of God and all that, uh, mm-hmm. I can take it or leave it. Mm-hmm. And really, uh, I-, I think people miss it because the character of God, having the character of God, demonstrating the character of God, and here here's re- really is, reflecting the character of God. That's the word. That's the important word, reflecting the character of God, because reflecting suggests that something is shining on me and it's bouncing from me, uh, emanating from me back out. When we say a mirror reflects the sun, the sun is shining on the mirror and the mirror is reflecting back what it takes in. And so reflecting the character of God says, I'm taking God in. Yeah. And he's bouncing off of me back out. So I I don't think there's an option. I think if we are saved, reflecting the character of God is a must because it says, I have him shining on me, he's inside of me, and then he's bouncing back off of me in my relationship to the world, in my relationship to family, in my relationship in dealing with people. Uh, that's beautiful. Let me say, t- uh, you know, my three R's <laughs> are resemble, reflect, and reveal the character of God. We are Amen. called to resemble, to reflect, and reveal the character of God. Sister Adley, yes, is it? Pastor, it's, yes, go ahead. Um, the one and only thing that we will be taken to heaven will be our characters. Yes. If we plan to be in heaven, we must begin to reflect his character here. Yes. And make it a must in our lives to reflect his character in everything we do and say. Yes. As a matter of fact, some people Amen. some people really believe that you can live any way you want to live, but you're going to come up with the character of God. Some people really believe, I don't have to worry about it, uh, but God has called us because he wants us to grow every day to become Amen. more like him. Uh, Sister Ruthie, why do you think... I don't think it's an option. Yes, go ahead. I don't think it's an option, is it? No, no, it is not an option. Uh, and, and I jokingly tell people that uh, nobody's going to be in heaven walking up to an angel and saying, would you say to me... <laughs> <laughs> you're going to have your character fixed now. <laughs> you're, not, you're, gonna, you're not going to heaven with an attitude. You know what I mean? Uh, but, but why do you think the enemy has been so successful in not focusing or in keeping us as people of God from focusing on becoming more like the character of God. Why has he been so successful, do you think? Uh, Sister Ruthie, why do you think he's been so successful? 
Well, I think one of the things that he uses, Wentley, is fear. Mm. I think he doesn't want us to understand what a loving and tender God we have, mm -hmm. compassionate. And um, I liked something that uh, Pastor Blakesley said. He said, God is standing at the foot of your bed when you wake up in the morning, anxious for you to wake up so that he can spend some time with you. Yeah. I think one of the ways that the enemy, uh, one of the things he uses is fear. Mm -hmm. He he doesn't want us to know that we're forgiven, that we can be cleansed, that the Holy Spirit can dwell in us. He lies about this. Yeah. Uh, uh, Pastor Stoddard, why do you think the enemy has been so successful? We, I believe one of the reasons he's so successful is because that is his primary focus. That's the thing he wants to do more than anything else is to efface the character of That's God right. in us because he's angry that God made us in his image. And, and right. so through, throughout history, that's what his focus has been. How can I obliterate? How can I destroy? How can I, how can I deface the character of God in Wintley, in Adley, in Ruthie, in Errol? Because that's the main thing he's about. Uh, so tell me what you think about that, Pastor Dottie. Well, I, I think that when we look at when we look at history, and uh, I, I love history. I try to be a student of history. Yes. Uh, when you look at the even the early church, when you look at the message to the seven churches, we see this business of of compromise, the the breakdown of what Christ was all about. Yes. There was this gradualization mm -hmm. into secularization. Yes. There was this shifting. Um, as seemingly the church uh, wanted to be more like the world uh, in order to uh, attract the world, seemingly. Yes. Or people who came into the church were not truly converted to the principles of the church. Yes. And the standards began to be lowered. And, and throughout history, uh, one of the great challenges we see is uh, people who call themselves Christian badly reflecting the character of God. Absolutely. And the character of God becoming effaced throughout history as these great people who were to be bastions of Christianity, who were uh, the leaders of Christianity, uh, who in essence did everything they could that was opposed to the example of Christ. When we think of the popes, uh, we think of, uh, of the, the whole reason for the Reformation. Yeah. Uh, and I was reading recently again about, I did a series recently on Islam and the fact that the Prophet Muhammad, one of the things that drove him away from Christianity, because in his early years, mm. he was raised with tremendous exposure to Christian Christian values, to Christian principles. Mm. He had read his Bible as a, as a young person, as a child. Mm. But one of the things that drove him away from Christianity was the example of people who called themselves Christian. And, uh, and so whether it's uh, secularization, whether it's the need to make people feel more comfortable coming into the church, whether it's lowering the standards, whether it's people feeling like, I don't need to be bothered with all that. I just need to claim Jesus, and that's enough yeah, for me. Yeah, yeah. All of these things, I believe, impacted the breakdown of Christianity and what we could technically call the secularization of Christianity. Right. Uh, before we leave, we tell leave. each of you, just give me one thing you think churches can do to help grow people to become, become more like the character of Christ. What's the one thing you would like churches to do? And, and we just have a few seconds. Sister Adley. Well, uh, we need to teach more and speak more on this subject yes. of reflecting Jesus. In the importance that has not time now of us as Christians yes. not to be distracted with so many other topics and subjects yes, yes. that we are not 
spending time with Jesus, right. beholding his glory, exactly. beholding his character so that we can become like him. Absolutely. Unless we do that, we will not be successful in our efforts to behold, to contemplate Christ and imitate him and reflect his character to the world. So well said. We run out of time. Thank you so much for being with us today. The Lord has made it possible for us to have a righteous character in this life so that we may reflect the image of Christ to the world and bring hope and joy to others. By the power of the Holy Spirit, the moral image of God is to be perfected in our character. Every day, we are kept by the power of God and Jesus wants to live his life in us, perfecting our character. And he wants us to work to the utmost of our knowledge and power to carry out the purpose for which he came and lived and died. And that is to restore us into the image and character of God. And the molding hand of God will bring out in us God's character and God's divine image. Everyone who wants to enter the kingdom of God will develop a character that is the counterpart of the character of God. And because no one can dwell with God in heaven except those who bear his likeness, Jesus came to earth that he might transform the character and develop in us the moral image of God. Higher than the highest human thought can reach is God's ideal for his children. Godliness, godlikeness, and yes, Christlikeness is the goal to be reached. Because of God's love and power, we all can say, as I become more like Jesus, he is perfecting me. Hebrews 13, 20 says, Now may the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. There is nothing more important or more exciting you can do with your life than to become more like Jesus every day. I'm Wentley Phipps, and until next time, remember, to be a Christian is to be Christ-like.